Hello and welcome to Footnotes the Cicerone podcast, a podcast to inspire you about outdoor travel and activities in the UK and across the world. I'm Hannah and you can email me with your thoughts or questions on live at cicerone.co.uk. Today I'm here with Nike and Yacint, authors of the Cicerone guidebook to the Robert Louis Stevenson Trail or the GR70 as it's named as well. This is a long distance route through France's Valais and Cévennes regions and Nikkei and Yacint will tell you more about it. Hello Nikkei and Yacint. Hi Hannah. So the route basically it starts from Le Puy and Valais for Givar French pronunciation let's be I'm not familiar with them entirely. However the route is a 275 kilometer long distance trail starting from Le Puy and Valais ending in Alès. So not the whole route was part of the official GR70, but recent years uh, they added the last section between uh, Saint Jean du Gard and Alès to the official trail as well, because most people finish their walks in Alès anyway. Uh, Robert Lee Stevenson finished his trail in Saint Jean du Gard, where actually he sold modesty in his donkey with big rats. Of course, the trail goes through a high plateau in the beginning before actually heading up to the highest point, which is a uh, peak of Phineas, uh, 1,699 meters. That's where it gets a bit more mountainous. The high plateau is relatively easy. So I would say it's a very good trail to start for someone who hasn't done long distance trail before, because the trail eases the person into the walk nice and gently, and then it just gets a little bit harder towards the end. Okay, so before we get into the actual talking about the route a bit more, we don't normally start off our podcasts talking about donkeys. Who is Robert Louis Stevenson and why did this random Scottish guy end up walking through France with a donkey? Yeah, that's a really good question. So Robert Louis Stevenson was a a Scottish writer and he spent lots of time in France. And uh, in 1878, he he spent one month in a small village near Le Puy. It's called uh, Monastir sur Cazir. And uh, after a month, he, he, he decided to walk all the way to Alice. He was in love with an American woman who was 10 years older than him, but she went back to America to divorce her husband. So Stevenson wanted to use the time because he was left alone in France. And uh, also he was waiting for a letter from her. And back in those days, you couldn't just get a letter anywhere in France. So he had to go to a post office in Lyon. So he he bought a donkey and uh, he walked for 12 days with a donkey all the way to saint jean de garde And um, along his way, he met lots of people and he wrote about his experience in his journal. And basically the GR70 trail follows roughly his footsteps through, through the sevens. I say roughly because we don't exactly know which route he took because back in those days, they didn't have signposted paths, trails for hikers. People didn't just go for a hike. So it was very, very unusual for someone just to walk for days and days and days. So the locals weren't quite sure about the whole thing. So the trail connects these little villages where he stopped with a donkey. And some nights he spent in the woods white camping if you like but obviously he didn't have a tent or anything like that so he just uh, slept in the woods other nights he spent in sheet and walkers these days probably will do the same thing not to sleep in the woods but to spend the night in sheets or very very small uh, family-run accommodations in teeny weeny villages so the locals made really good business out of this trail because some of the tiny villages probably you wouldn't visit if it was not for Stevenson. Uh, so back to the donkey. Uh, walking with a donkey is very, very slow and very, very difficult. So Stevenson experienced lots of problems with his donkey. So the first part of his book is really, really funny because he writes a lot about the, the problems he experienced with the donkey. And that's, a, that's another thing. It's a great thing to read the original book on the trail because it gives you a really good insight the, the way people lived back then and, and about the landscape and, and the villages and the local people. So he, he was a lovesick guy walking for weeks and weeks to go and get a letter 
to see whether he could marry his girlfriend. And he decided to take a donkey. Yeah. So you wouldn't get that these days. He took a donkey because uh, obviously he had to carry a couple of things. And uh, even the sleeping bag was a lot heavier 140 years ago than now. And some of the cooking equipment he, he carried. And um, so he decided to take a donkey to help him to carry his things. Uh, these days you can take a donkey on this trail with you. There are some companies hiring out donkeys. So people still do that? Some people do. Yeah, some people do. Uh, donkeys are still very slow. So <laughs> so most people don't do it for the for the entire trail, but it's probably it's good fun. We saw families doing it with, with small kids. So the donkey can carry most of your things and I believe they can carry up to forty kilograms. So yeah. You can choose if you are a family, you can put your luggages uh, or for a short period of time, you can put your child on the donkey yeah. as well to have a rest while they walk on. And also some of the accommodation provides some place for the, for the donkeys for the night yeah. as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> so did, did you take a donkey for any of your trip? No, I'm no, afraid not. <laughs> no. I think it would probably make the process of writing a guidebook slightly more difficult. Yes, it is very interesting because it took Stevenson 12 days to get to Saint Jean de Garde. And the trail is 12 stages now as well. So even though it's slightly longer what what he walked, it still takes 12 days to get from Le Puy to Alice. So I'm not quite sure how he managed that because some days he walked very, very short distance. Sometimes he only walked in the afternoon. He took it very leisurely, especially at the beginning, because he spent mornings writing up his journal and then he had lunch with the lockers and he only sat off in the afternoon. And then it was late September, so it started to get dark earlier, so he had to stop and spend the night somewhere. So, yeah, I highly recommend to read the book on the trail because it's really good. Yeah, I can see why his book would be a compliment to your book, but you probably wouldn't want to rely on that for navigation. <laughs> no, no, no. But you do follow the route as closely as you can. Yeah, so it's a very marked route now. So it's really easy to follow. Uh, you you don't have to rely on Stevenson's book uh, to follow the route. And And what's the walking like? I mean, 12 days is perfect for a two week holiday. You mentioned that there are people that do it with families. So is it fairly easy walking? Yes, I would say it is. There is only one stage you can't make any shorter what it is in the book. And uh, that's quite a long uh, stage. But apart from that, all the other stages, you can make them even a bit shorter if you like. So you can stop in a different village. You don't necessarily have to stop in the villages we mentioned in the book. However, these 12 stages are the main ones. So most of the time you find these 12 stages everywhere. So these are the most popular stops, I would say. This is the closest you can get to uh, Stevenson stops as well. But there are some, there is an option to stop somewhere else, but doesn't matter where you want to spend the night, you probably have to book it ahead because this is a very popular trail. And so in the summer, lots of people walk the trail and in some places uh, there aren't many accommodation available. Sometimes it is uh, very important to look further out from the trail. So sometimes you don't find accommodation in a certain little village, then you have to look further away. You may have to walk an extra couple of kilometers yeah. or even more to stay somewhere. It happened to us as well. So yeah, it is it is part of the experience too. Yeah. In, in our guidebook, we try to point out these things. So we try to have the walkers with, with uh, alternative accommodation options or villages if we, if we could. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a fairly, it's a fairly standard thing to try and book ahead in places, isn't it? Especially if you're going in the summer, yeah. you know, it can be busy for, for all variety of reasons. So yeah, that's a good point. And camping as well. Can you do wild camping or is it campsite camping? Um, it's mainly campsite camping. Uh, we have seen many people carrying their big rucksacks with their camping equipment. Uh, most of them who we spoke to, they stayed at campsites. However, we have seen even a family camping uh, in the woods or on the side of the trail. I would say it's a yes and no. Um, I would highly recommend campsites for obvious reasons as well. I think in the 7th, it's not 
national parks yeah. uh, generally they don't allow it yeah but yeah you will always see people who are <laughs> breaking the rules um yeah and most people yeah. they stay in campsites. campsites yeah so if the trail is quite easy does that mean there's nothing challenging for more experienced walkers well there are some sections which are long so i would say it's easy but you still need to have a reasonable level of fitness to do this trail and walking for every day for 12 days it can be challenging <laughs> and and obviously the the section the length yeah. length of the sections some of them are like 30 kilometers yeah. or 20 something yeah even on consecutive days as well yeah. so yeah you need to be a little bit fit for for that and, even though the terrain itself is not that challenging as an alpine trail for example yeah. you don't get very technical terrain on the route no. yeah yeah mind you there's a lot of people who think that easy just means boring but that's not the case with this trail is it no no, no i think i think the landscape is beautiful and uh, and you have this story behind it so if you like reading books and and you like the story behind this trail then i think it's and you get a lot of history as well yeah. as you go through certain parts uh obviously the cities uh and the towns you yeah. you pass through they have lots to see as well yeah so what's the what's the landscape like that you're walking through so we start off on a high plateau basically as we ascend from Le Puy and Valais. Generally that part of the walk runs around a thousand meter elevation. It's surrounded by fields and farmlands as well as forested areas too. But later on, as you reach the higher sections of the trail, you get uh, proper mountains, uh, forested mountains and a view across the whole of the sevens and the very last stage that's a little bit more trickier more I would say that's the most uh, technically challenging for an ordinary walker the last stage between Saint Jean du Gard and Alès because you get uh, many very narrow trails with some rocky outcrops here and there sometimes you need to check your footing there as well so you get all sorts of different uh, variety of sections Right. I think you probably knew I was going to ask this. So hopefully you've come up with some sort of answer to what your favourite bit might be. This always catches authors out because obviously you've done the whole route. You've written about it all. Most authors sort of squirm a little bit and say, why did you ask me this? Um, is it possible to come up with a favourite section? Yes. Okay, Nikkei. So my favorite <laughs> section, it has to be the when we enter the seventh. So it's between probably Le Blémard to Pont de Montvert. Pont de Montvert is a really pretty village. And as we were descending from the highest mountains of the trail towards the little village, it's just a beautiful area. And we had a great day because it was very sunny and there were lots of white flowers and orchids along the trail as well. So so it was it was just a beautiful, perfect day. And at the end, when we arrived to this small village, we went down to the river because it was a hot day. And uh, it was it was really nice. And did you swim in the river? Well, we went in, let, <laughs> let's put it that way. It was freezing cold, but it felt really great. After walking all day, it felt really good to go into this really cold water. <laughs> it felt great. Yeah, get yes. your hot feet in there and, and see the steam come off. And what, what day is that? That's stage seven. And then the following oh, nice. one, stage eight, is also very nice. But that stage eight is probably the most difficult one, the longest one, but with some great views. So you don't really think about the kilometers because you have great views all, all day. It's very scenic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Yasin, what's your favorite bit then, do you think? Well, I have to agree with Nikki on, on this section. This is the most picturesque of all the sections. Uh, I really loved having that little village down in the valley sliced by this river and it's just um, almost like a, a fable like uh, landscape it's really really lovely um it was good to stay in that i would say quiet village but not no. not really because it's also other people's favorite as well <laughs> so yes uh, out of season i would say it's, it's a very sleepy little village but in the high walking season you get a lot of walkers through the village and it's got its own little history as well 
Also, uh, after the next section, you've got the Kasanias area, which is also one of my favorite. The cover of the book is depicts uh, a viewpoint uh, just after Kasanias, which is overlooking basically the whole of the sevens. Uh, I think it, it was the most beautiful uh, view of the whole of it. It just totally blew my mind away. Uh, yeah, so I would add that to my favorite list, definitely. <laughs> It's so nice that you agree with each other on your favourite bit. I think that's probably helpful when you're writing a book together that you can uh, agree with each other on these things. Yeah, I think it's easier to walk with the artist than with the donkey. But Faster. I never, I haven't tried with the donkey though. What, can what a good... review, Yasin! <laughs> oh, brilliant! He can, he can take good photos. I don't think a donkey would do no, that. No, probably would. Modest thing wouldn't do that. <laughs> can he carry forty kilos? That's quite a lot. Mm, no, no. no. But um, we try to keep the weight to the minimum. You yeah. don't need much. So if you go as someone who is who got used to walking long distance trails, they learn their lessons probably <laughs> after the first trip uh, to take as little as possible. I carried some books, but <laughs> <laughs> did you actual actual books? Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't take an egg risk. What Stevenson took, yeah. and carefully got rid of did it. Did he? Yes. yes. See, uh, his kit list, his kit list is ridiculous. He takes a donkey and an egg whisk. Like, I'm going to follow your advice on kit. He threw his egg whisk away on day two, two? or three. <laughs> we didn't throw anything away. Come. So. <laughs> Why would you even take an egg whisk? I know people weren't walkers then, and this was quite a new, strange activity. But even then, you know, you can survive without an egg whisk for, I'm going to say, years. I could survive without a whisk for years. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Yatin couldn't survive without a bottle opener, so we had to buy one on our first day in Le Puy. Yeah, first things first. I mean, if you go to France or when you go to France, it's you need cheese, the, the wine and nice bread they have. So that's what we lived on basically <laughs> on the trail during the day. And in the evenings, obviously, we stayed in Sheets and they had wonderful food as well if we used their facilities. But nice, honest, local cooking. That's what we needed at the end of a long walking day. Yeah, exactly. It sounds really charming. I've got this nice image of the little sleepy French villages welcoming you with wine and bread and cheese. And it just sounds, it does sound really, really charming. In in one place we could, there, there was no shops or anything like that, but we could buy cheese and wine from from the butcher. Oh, that was in uh, Le Pont de Montvert, yeah. our favorite little village. The, the bakery was open, so we could get some bread, and then we went to the butcher and we bought some wow. wine and cheese. <laughs> I mean, what what more do you need? Yeah. You can survive on that. So you, you mentioned that in the summer you it does get a bit busier and that you need to book ahead. But what's the sort of walking season for this route? So uh, most accommodations are only open from April till October. So you, you only get a couple of months when you could do the walk because uh, most of the places close down for, for the winter. So possibly you can do the walk during the winter, but I think you would need more planning. Uh, they do get lots of snow in the winter, so... So it might not all be possible in the in the snow. I don't think many people do it. We we spoke to uh, a couple of the hosts where we stayed, and they said they they don't have anyone coming through in the winter, so they they keep closed during the winter months. Yeah. I mean, April to October is quite a long time. I think yeah. it's quite a long season. However, in April and May, you can still get some very cold days and even snow as well on the higher grounds because it's a high plateau. So they do get a little bit of snow in April and May. So if you go that early in the season and also the autumn months, September and October can be quite rainy as well, I would say. So definitely I would aim for the, the summer months. And what's the what's the weather like compared to the UK? It is quite nice, almost continental, but because you are high up, so you won't get that scorching hot days or maybe you get an odd one or two days. Yeah. But we only get the, got the very hottest days towards the end or closer to Alice because yeah. that's a lot lower as well. So that's below like 600 meters and you get almost like a proper mm, sub-Mediterranean weather. So it gets quite hot <laughs> in the summer. It wasn't too hot for us to walk in August. And most French people walk the chair during the August holidays. Okay. 
Well, that sounds like quite a mild summer option then. Yes, I would, I would think so. If you'd like a copy of Nikkei and Yassint's guidebook to walking the Robert Louis Stevenson Trail, please have a look at our website, www.cicerone.co.uk. And because you're a podcast listener, you can use the code FRANCE to give you a 25% discount. Thanks for listening to the podcast, and I hope you get a chance to explore the Robert Louis Stevenson Trail for yourself. Um, is there anything that you think that we should talk about that we haven't spoken about? I think we mentioned most of the things. Which is... Probably we can talk about the trail <laughs> or and our experiences for like days, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as much as I love talking to you, we don't have that long. <laughs> I think one more thing maybe uh, of the beginning of the trail, the, the town of Le Puy. It's a very popular destination for other walkers as well because it's, it's a crossroads of different trails, including the, including the Camino as well. Uh, so many, pe- many people start their track from, from there. So you've got lots of history in the town. So, so I would highly recommend to have a day there before you uh, set off for the Stevenson Trail because there's so much to see and do and eat. <laughs> it's really beautiful. So, yeah, highly recommend it. Lovely. Why did the end change again? Because you said that Stevenson walked to Saint Jean, and yeah, so uh, Stevenson stopped in Saint Saint Jean de Gard uh, because Modestine was too tired and she was declared unfit to travel. And Stevenson was really keen to get to Alice, so he he couldn't he couldn't wait there for days until they recover. And then so he took a coach to Alice. So lots of people do the same thing. You can take a, a bus to Alice and that's it. That's how most people end their trail. But uh, there is a trail between the two towns. And uh, when we did the trail first time, it was a really long trail. And we had to follow lots of different, differently waymarked trails to get to Alice. But the following year, when we went back, the GR70 trail was extended to Alice. So we had like fresh waymarks to follow. So because lots of people wanted to do the trail all the way to Alice, they basically made the route all the way to Alice. Official. Officially, yeah. So now you can see the, the official GR70 signs all the way to Alice, which is very helpful because the, the last bit was a bit tricky without them. So I'm glad we went back when yeah. we went back. So in the book, you can see the new official ending, basically. Yeah. And what happened to Modestine? So, uh, Steven Zon saw oh, her. So she probably went in a pie. I would like to believe that then she had a more restful <laughs> life after that big trek. A happy <laughs> retirement. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, uh, Steven Zon was um, very ahead right. of his time, I believe, with his thinking and his walking, hiking, and just the way he wrote his, uh, his book as well. Because if you read it, you will see that he's got his funny side in there as well. It's almost like Bill Bryson 142 <laughs> years ago. Fantastic. One more thing I wanted to mention was there's a really nice quote in the introduction of your Robert Louis Stevenson book. And he says, for my part, I travel not to go anywhere, but to go. I travel for travel's sake. I think that's really nice. And he mentions to come down off this feather bed of civilization and find the globe granite underfoot. It's like he needs to travel and he wants to get away from his normal, comfortable life and find a real world. And I think that really will resonate with a lot of our audience. Um, Certainly me. I mean, I don't really feel like I have a feather bed of civilization under me all the time. But it definitely reconnects you with what's important when you get out into the outdoors, go for a walk or a cycle ride. I really love that you included that in your introduction. Yeah, I I agree. I think everyone who reads this book will somehow highlight this uh, quote from him. It's known by others as well, and it just captured our attention as well. And this could also be the motto of Cicerone as well, pretty much, because as you said, many of Cicerone's readers and the users of the guidebooks, they, they are on the same wavelength with this, with this uh, quote. Yeah, fantastic. Any, any final thoughts? Uh, the, the book mentions the, the transport you can use if you only want to do some sections of it, because then you need to plan 
how how you get to the trail and how you travel from the trail as well. The main airport uh, is Lyon. Is, is Lyon. I think that's probably the easiest and best served airport and uh, just an um, hour and a half train ride or maybe two hours to, to, Le Puy. to Le Puy. So relatively easy access. The trains are good and there's lots of flights to yeah. Lyon. Yeah, the cheapest way is to get a return flight to yeah. Lyon. But it's always cheaper to get the return flights than two single flights. Because it was very easy to get back from Alès to yeah, Lyon. Yeah, yeah. You only had, had to change uh, train and name. Yeah. And that's it. It was yeah. nice and easy, very comfortable, right? When we did it, we looked at it from every angle and looked where else we could stay just to maximize the options for everyone. Yeah. And also, I think the 12 day we wanted to stick to because Steam is under it in 12 days as well. And that's a quite optimal. But you can as well. go slower if you wanted to. Yeah, definitely. And some people do it faster. You can just go there and do like the first half of it or the second half of it. If you follow the book and uh, you, you have the added help, so you know which, which villages you would like to stay. So that makes it easier. Oh man, fingers crossed. This is the summer that we can go and do stuff. All right. Well, it's been really nice to talk to you. And you. Bye. Take care. Bye. I hope you enjoyed the latest episode of Footnotes, the Cicerone podcast. I'd love to know what you think, or if there's anything you'd like us to cover in future episodes. Please email live at cicerone.co.uk or leave a review on your favourite pod- podcast platform. You can follow or subscribe to the podcast to make sure you don't miss new episodes or sign up to our newsletter for all our latest news, events and guidebooks. Visit cicerone.co.uk for further details. We'll be back in a couple of weeks, but in the meantime, please come and join us on our social channels. We're on all the main ones at Cicerone Press, and we also have a Facebook group, Cicerone Connect, where you can meet and chat to other outdoor enthusiasts. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you soon.